Hey everybody, welcome to Intel on AI. I'm Ryan Carson, one of your hosts today. And I'm Lindsay Brown. Good to have everybody here today. We have an awesome guest that I'm excited to chit chat to today. His name is Scott Tease, and he is Vice President and General Manager of Lenovo's Infrastructure Solutions Group. And Scott leads Lenovo's global strategy for AI and high performance computing, championing both innovation and sustainability in these fields. Since joining Lenovo in 2014, after a 14 year career with IBM, Scott has driven Lenovo's HPC presence to new heights. Under his leadership, Lenovo has become a powerhouse in the supercomputing world with over one in three systems on the top 500 list bearing the Lenovo name. Good to have you here, Scott. Thanks so much for joining. Ryan. Looking forward to chatting. Yeah, Ryan, Lindsay, nice to be here with you both. Thanks for having me. First of all, let's kind of go into the world of AI, high performance computing, and talk a little bit about sustainability. Um, I want to dig into specifically where we're going with AI compute on the edge. Like we've got a lot of compute happening now, uh, you know, on laptops and the edge, and models are getting smaller. But where do you see everything going? Well, you know, there's a lot of interest out there just in kind of big AI, you know, building out generative AI, the big, you know, large language models. Um, but, you know, once we have those built, um, it doesn't take like a huge amount of processing power to kind of take advantage of them. We can privatize a model with relatively lightweight server hardware and even some laptops and edge devices. So I kind of see AI spreading out from where it's highly concentrated right now with the big clouds to kind of being literally everywhere on every desk, besides every desk, out at the edge in a retail environment or in a manufacturing location, and most certainly out in a data center. And these are not gonna be like the kind of AI solutions that you might be reading about today where they're like, you know, 10 kilowatts per chassis and $250,000 machines. These are everyday machines that we can like literally hold in our hand and they can, you know, fit into a personal budget. So that's what's so exciting about it. Do you think that this is happening because we have labs like Meta pushing so hard on, on releasing smaller models. I know we had Llama 3.2 come out, which is only a billion parameters. Like, are they pushing this or is this, you know, folks like Inova pushing compute on the edge or a bit of both? Like, what's unlocking this? Yeah, that's a, man, that's a good question. So, you know, definitely, you know, having, having supporters of open source like Meta and like Google and, and you know, all the big hyperscalers helps, helps a lot. Um, but this is really kind of a community effort uh, to drive AI uh, for everybody. Basically, you know, we think AI for all is the right way to approach this thing. If all AI is only done on the cloud, um, it's going to really limit who's going to be able to take advantage of it. Our, our belief is that AI is going to happen wherever your data um, is stored. Da you always heard the term data has gravity. Well, AI is going to prove that like never before. Um, instead of bringing your data out to the AI, we firmly believe that people are going to bring the AI to their data and that everyone's going to need one of those big, big machines. A lot of it's going to be done on a Xeon processor or maybe a lightweight graphics processor, something like that. So it'll be easily attainable by a lot more people than I think you, know, you read about in the press today. Yeah, absolutely. I know that uh, I keep saying that I feel like every family is going to be doing compute on the edge. Um, you know, you think about businesses and cities, but... I feel like I need um, some inference to figure out where my kids are. <laughs> well, you know, we're going to see we're going to see you know the AI PC show up this year in a big way, and it's really going to personalize. We've been calling it a personal computer for you know decades, but it's truly going to become personal. It's going to know all about you. It's going to help you you know make better decisions. It's going to make us all more productive. And again, that's it's it's just going to show up in our lives, kind of like you know home automation when we you know have a Amazon device or a Google Home device. We speak to it. We ask it to do things. I don't think the first thing that people think about when they do that is AI, mm -hmm. but that those systems are loaded with all kinds of AI, natural language processing and things like that, that are just integrated in. And we don't, again, we don't think about the technology behind it. We just like what it does for us. It helps us, you know, make the homework better, turn lights off when we're about to go to sleep, you know, you know, adjust the thermostat, whatever it might be. But um, we're hoping that, you know, AI through AI PC and what we're doing with Motorola is going to bring that AI power down so everybody just, it's part of their lives every single day. Yeah. And Scott, I think uh, consumers really like to know how manufacturers are making 
products more sustainable. Can you tell us more how uh, Lenovo or others are making servers and storage more energy efficient for AI? Yeah. So, I mean, literally every product that we have at Lenovo, whether it's, again, a Motorola phone or a ThinkPad or a server or a storage device, uh, we all have, we have sustainability goals that start at the very beginning of the life of that product. Um, they involve things like the cir- you know, circular economy for the parts. Um, you know, when I, when I uh, use steel to make a, a server chassis, for instance, I've got two locations I can get that steel. I can get virgin steel material, which has a very heavy carbon footprint in manufacturing it, or I can get recycled steel components, um, which are a little harder to get, um, but they have a much, much lower carbon footprint to kind of recycle those into new components. So kind of closing the loop on all of our devices, the plastics, the, the heavy metals, the steel, you know, the aluminum, those kind of things is a really big deal to us. Um, you know, our systems are made to be 100% recyclable. We, we work a lot on the packaging of the devices. And I'm, I mean, packaging from everything like when you buy a new phone, all the way to you get one of these really, really large, you know, 8U servers that, you know, that weigh like 100 pounds. We're looking at how we make that, that um, lighter weight on the environment um, as we're shipping it. So there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, one of the biggest, however, is focusing on energy consumption. Now, I, I know most people don't think about power consumption and sustainability, and they're like, well, how, how are those things connected? Well, every watt of energy that we burn, whether it's running my laptop that we're doing this call via right now, uh, whether it's my phone or whether it's a, a big AI server, an HPC cluster, every kilowatt of power has to be generated. And the majority of the power we're generating right now comes from burning some kind of fossil fuel, you know, coal or oil or natural gas. Uh, when we do that, we release carbon in the environment. Um, believe it or not, for most devices, about 80% of the carbon emissions over the lifespan of the device comes from the power consumption that that device uses over its life. So if you can, if you can focus on energy efficiency, you're going to make a big difference in a couple ways. One, you're going to save our, cust- our consumers and our customers money on their, their power bill on a monthly basis, especially with a big data center. Uh, but you're also going to lighten their, their impact on the environment by not causing you know, the consumption of so much power. So it's kind of a, a double benefit. Right. So I think all of us on the call and probably everybody listening knows that morally it's the right thing to do to source your materials sustainably. And we want that to happen. But how do businesses make that choice financially? You know, where does rubber meet the road and actually help you be more profitable on that? How do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> that's a good question. I, you know, when I first started working on sustainability, you know, many years ago, the, you know, what I was seeing from people was this story that to be more sustainable, it was going to cost more money and you had to do it for, you know, reasons you wanted to be a better citizen or what have you. What I'm seeing now is that economy and business advantage kind of go hand in hand with sustainability. And again, that example that I just gave you on power consumption, I use less power, my power bill goes down every single month. There's the economic benefit. The uh, environmental benefit is I'm releasing less CO2. Um, We are trying to do our best to close the loop on those commodities at the end of life. So Lenovo has a program we call uh, Lenovo uh, Asset Recovery Services. Basically, we will take like old servers, old storage, old laptops, from our customers, we generally will pay them the, some value for those end of life products. We will then recycle those commodities back down and build them in the next generation of products. Now, the business advantage for our customers for that is they actually get a check. This stuff has value to it. Even if it's five or six years old, many times the dims can be resold or upcycled. Um, a lot of the parts can be recycled for their basic commodities like the steel and the plastics, things like that. And other things, we just make sure they don't end up in a landfill. The customer actually gets a check for that. Uh-huh. Um, and at the same time, we're closing a loop on our next generation of products. So, again, those kind of things go hand in hand. And we mentioned packaging as well. Um, if I can ship in bulk um, instead of packaging everything in tiny little boxes with you know, plastic bags and on a bunch of pallets, that, that's great for the environment. But if I can ship it at, like in a data center, if I can ship to our customer fully configured at a rack level, right out of our factory. Um, It never went in a bunch of cardboard. It never went in styrofoam. It's got a lot less papers for warranty. I'm speeding their time to production, the business value. The economic value is I'm saving trees and things like that by reducing packaging. So in my opinion, sustainability these days kind of goes hand in hand with business value. And that's why I think it's it's gotten so popular around the world to care care about it. Not, not saying that people don't care about the environment, but it makes it a lot easier 
when it's more than, you know, just I'm, I'm a good citizen. So uh, I've got a lot of computers down in my basement, so I'm looking forward to shipping <laughs> yep. to you and getting checks. Getting that check. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice to think that those are not going to end up in a landfill somewhere? Oh, yeah. Uh, you know, with a battery leaching out or whatever, but instead it's, it's you know, part of our next ThinkPad line or our next yeah, uh, 2U server or what have you. You know, that's a, that's that's a really good, cool. that helps you sleep at night. Oh, yeah. yeah and does. speaking of, you know, sleeping at night, Scott, are there any other ways that any other advice that you have for leaders trying to make that case internally for sustainability investment? How do you take that beyond just the bottom line? Well, so, you know, being being such a global company as we are, we, you know, n- not every region around the world is at the same level when they're when they're thinking about sustainability. Um, I think the leaders mm-hmm. in the world when it comes to sustainability is, is the Europeans. They um They've been at this for a while, and we can learn a lot about how they're looking at purchasing a new gear, what they're looking for in RFQs and you know requests for quotes and, and their purchasing decisions. A lot of those are being driven by things like energy efficiency, uh, the supply chain, you know, the greenness of the supply chain, our ability to kind of close the loop on commodities. Um, in fact, we've got a lot of customers that are even promoting the concept of having some, some percentage of recycled content you know, in what they're purchasing. So kind of all these things are, are they're, I would say they're emerging in many parts of the world, but in some parts like in Europe, we see it a lot in Germany, we see it a lot in the Nordics. These are co- very commonplace things. And, uh, you know, as, as more people make that connection between the business benefit and the economic benefit, I, I think it's just going to get more powerful. And, um, you know, the cynic in me says that the higher our power costs go over time, the more likely we're going to also see a focus on sustainability because of that connection between power consumption and energy usage in our, in our energy bill. Um, you know, we've seen some locations in Europe like the UK and in Germany where we're, we've seen power go up almost 3x over the past couple of years. And that will, that will change behaviors uh, very, very quickly when you see that kind of increase in your power bill. So I, I think we're just going to continue to see more and more of that across the world. That leads to my next question, which is where are we going to go uh, to generate the kind of electricity we need for these massive AI workloads, specifically in the data center. I mean, we're ta- like people are talking about, you know, ten, you know, gigawatt data centers. Yeah. And so, <clears throat> just what's your thought about yeah. where we're going to go and how are we? Gonna Man, get I, is there a way to pass on that question, Ryan? Seriously, I, I have no idea. <laughs> I, I, so, to, I, actually, to be honest with you, so it, it is. It will be a lot of power, and it's not just for data centers. It's. I mean, our population is growing. We're putting more electric cars in the road. You know, we're, we're placing ever more demands on the power grid. At the same time, we're placing all this additional demand. You know, we're, we're asking the power grid to go green. By 2040, uh, the global power grid is supposed to be green, which means all built on re- renewable types of power, um, you know, non-emitting types of power. So you've got one trend pulling us away from using those traditional, you know, uh, components for making power like oil, coal, things like that. That's reducing our ability to generate power, and you got all this increased demand. So it, it is going to be a, a significant problem. Um, my advice is that everyone needs to look at all of their power consumption. Some, you know, in the past we could waste power, and it wasn't that bad of a problem. When we were talking about data centers that were 100 kilowatts or you know two or 300 kilowatts, you could be a little bit kind of not very you know conservative on power. When you're talking about a gigawatt data center, every single watt matters. And what strikes me, Ryan, this is so funny to me. So, you know, that movie, Back to the Future, uh, when they made that movie, when they, I know Ryan I love that loves movie. Back it's so to funny. the Future. Um, when they made that movie, <laughs> what, what made the flux capacitor work was 1.2 gigawatts of power. And that was like some kind of like insane amount of oh. like fantasy power. Yeah, insane. And now we're talking about data centers that are bigger than that. Just one company. So yeah. it's just, we've come a long way very quickly. Um, you know, so I don't want to be negative on it, but we do have a challenge as society. Um, the goodness that both AI and HPC are going to do for us, um, you know, a, as a planet, not as countries or whatever, as a planet, is going to be a big deal. Um, we, we, we've got to continue to do this kind of research and make these kind of advantage, advance, uh, advances, but it does take power. You know, it, it's going to take power to do that. And just so you know, there's two types of people. There's one type of person that says 1.21 gigawatts, and there's one point. 1.21 gigawatts. So now I know which one you are. <laughs> which one are you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, Scott, how, can you tell us how Lenovo is using AI in its sustainability approach? With AI today, we've got two, two types of AI buyers. We've got our big buyers that are buying, you know, very large GPU machines, 
um, you know, huge amounts of power consumption. What we're doing in that side of the business is we're trying to focus our energy on making those systems as energy efficient as we possibly can and rethinking the way that the data center itself works. Um, you know, when you hear that a server like one of these HEPU systems uh, is going to consume 10 kilowatts of power, that's only a part of the story. That's the power to run the IT itself. What we're not talking about is that if that goes into an air-cooled data center, it's likely going to cost us 40% more to air condition the resulting heat. Um, so we have this thing called the law of conservation of energy. And what it states, to, what it tells us is that energy can't be destroyed. It just can be converted. And when we use power in a server, what we're doing is we're converting that electrical energy from a kilowatt of electrical energy to a kilowatt of heat energy. So all that power that goes in, once it's used by the system, it gets converted to heat. We've got to deal with that heat. It's costly to air condition. It's costly to move air. So we're helping our customers rethink that. We're doing things like our Neptune liquid cooling that replaces air cooling and traditional air conditioning with using warm water. You know, water that's as hot as the hot water heater water in your home to cool the system. So we don't have to chill it. We don't have to move massive amounts of air. I could, I could run one of these big supercomputers or one of these AI clusters with essentially no specialized air conditioning at all. So that's what we're doing on the, on the big side of things. For everyone else that's not building their own large language model, what we're really focused on there is right-sizing the IT for the AI that that customer is going to need. The vast majority of AI is going to be able to run on a CPU. It could be a CPU inside of your laptop or it could be a CPU at an edge device or in a, in a data center. That's the vast majority of what we're going to need to, for most people. So let's not overkill. Let's not use too much power for running those inference models and things like that and just right-size the device for the job at hand. And I think that's where we can help the most there is just helping the customer understand what they need and making sure that they're not you know, consuming too much power to deliver that task. It, it's interesting because it, it feels counterintuitive that, that models are actually getting smaller now. Um, I think all of us believed, oh, we're going to need larger and larger models to deliver the kind of intelligence what we need. And now we're seeing, oh, we can use synthetic data to actually train, uh, use larger models to train smaller models and get you know, a billion parameter model on the edge that runs very well for less compute. And we're having, uh, you know, this is obviously why Intel loves Lenovo. We have a great partnership where we're shipping silicon, you're packaging into a powerful solution that's energy efficient and, and you can run these models very fast. I've got an AI PC on my desk right here and it's fast and you're right. It, a lot of that can just run on the CPU part of that. So um, now you said you were studying chemistry or new chemistry. So I'm going oh, to ask you a chemistry question. There's been a long time um, since I studied uh, chemistry, so, Ryan's, but go ahead. Go ahead. I'm <laughs> me getting... too. I'm I, it's been a long time since I studied chemistry, but you said you can put oh, hot yeah. water through yeah. and it can cool it. So like, how? Yeah. How does that kind of work? This is this better. is a beautiful story. It really is. I'm glad. I was worried you were going to ask me like a difficult chemistry question. You were going to make me look bad on the video <laughs> here. But the water <laughs> one is the one I can handle. So, um, so water inherently has like I, I don't know four thousand times more heat carrying capacity than air does. So if I can use water to transfer heat away from the part, I can do it with a lot less energy, a lot less volume than I went than I could with air. You know, the reason that we're using so much air cooling and like the fans are spinning so quickly is the parts themselves have gotten smaller, the footprint of the parts smaller. We're using more power, which we've already talked about. Every watt of power I use ends up coming out of that part in the form of heat. And then uh, simultaneously, we're being asked to keep those parts cooler than ever before to unlock these higher performance capabilities. So that's like a tough combination. You got a, a very small part giving off a lot of heat and you're asking us to keep it cool. That means if you're doing air cooling, you got to move a ton of air through that using the fans that are in the server. Those fans can easily consume, you know, 15% of your power budget just for those fans. When I replace all that infrastructure with liquid, um, all that fan power goes away. You go from 15% fan power down to zero. Um, and the reason we can use warm water is the water's just so much more efficient at removing the heat, even if the water's warm. I can keep the part colder with water than I can with air. And that, 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 I think that boggles most people's minds that, you know, 45C, uh, 127 degrees Fahrenheit, something like that, that's much hotter than you. That's scalding temperatures. We can cool the part with that and keep it cooler than you oh, can wow. with, say, you know, 73 degree air coming in the front of an air-cooled data center. So 
that's a big part of what we're doing and it's all physics right it's you know it's all physics water is just such a great heat carrier and that's why that's why we use right. it it's also safe if i ever have a spill or something i just mop it up um and you know it's it's just easy Lindsay, any other questions i and we cut this i can go more keep keep going okay. right <laughs> i got more <laughs> okay, yeah good. um so let's dive into the data center and what's happening because uh, as we've been talking about there's just a huge need for power huge need for cooling. Um, what do you see as some of the potential exciting things coming up in the future that Lenovo is thinking about when it comes to HPC data center, uh, where we'll get even more bang for our buck in the data center? Yeah. So, you know, I, you know this would be a good one just to talk about, talk about kind of a couple of angles with this. I mean, we got some cool stuff technology wise that I'd love to talk, we'll talk about, but you know, just the research that we're able to do with HPC and AI, it, it's game changing. I mean, you think about you know, for, for those people that might be watching that sat through this, these past two hurricanes that affected, you know, my home state of North Carolina and then Florida really badly, we could follow the track of, especially the last hurricane that hit Tampa Bay area, we were following the track of that hurricane for almost five days in advance. And the models that predicted the path of that hurricane were incredibly accurate. That's all thanks to the investments that we've made in high performance computing over time. Um, we're gonna see the exact same advances in AI uh, but what's even more exciting about AI is not only can we look at past data to build up models, but we can actually get in and start doing predictive things with the AI. So, you know, um, I, I think th that's the, to me, that's the, the most important thing that we're working on is how do we unlock new innovation, new research? You know, how do we do better things with medical diagnosis? How do we do better cancer research? You know, all those kinds of things. That, that is the ultimate goal of what we're trying to do is just, you know, change the world like that. Uh, technology wise, I think, you know, we were at our tech world event back in oh, a couple weeks ago in uh, Seattle, Washington, and we unveiled our newest supercomputing system. It's uh, one of it. One of the components is a Granite Rapids AP CPU by Intel. Um, that system is 100 percent liquid cooled. Uh, you do not need a traditional, you know, like a traditional data center air conditioning system. In fact, I'm sitting in my dining room here. If I had a supercomputing running right next to me. We'd be able to have a conversation just like we're having right now. It'll be totally quiet. And I would be able to run it in my house because it doesn't require any special air conditioning. All the heat of that system from the processor, the memory, the voltage regulation, the I.O., even the power supply is all being carried away from that system uh, with a liquid loop. So th those are the kind of things that I think make, will make a really big difference for the future. Our goal is to take as much of the power that used to be used for infrastructure and convert that power to be used by the IT itself. So we get you know, more money to go to the AI itself, more money to go to the HPC itself, rather than you know, blowing air around a room with an air conditioner in the data center. I've seen videos where folks are walking through data centers that are air-cooled versus liquid-cooled. It's, it's shocking and just how much more enjoyable it is to be in a liquid-cooled facility. Oh, yeah. Um, and it kind of leads to actually what you're talking about, where you're kind of joking about having a super supercomputer next to you in your home, but um, where it seems like we might end up with, like I said, families actually having compute in their home because we're going to end up in a world where, you know, folks want private compute, you know, they want local compute, they want more affordable compute. Like, do you think we'll end up in a world where, you know, that happens or where are we going to go with compute? And I know it's a big question. Just curious. Yeah, so <clears throat> I don't I don't think we're going to end up in a world that's there. I think we're already in a hybrid AI world. So you think about um, you think about your mobile phone. Some people turn their mobile phone on with their face. Some I do it with my thumbprint when I touch my Moto phone. Um, running that inference model to do that, it's that's AI, pure AI right there. We don't think about it being AI, but it's AI to run that inference model. I do it right on my mobile phone to build that model. I did it out in the cloud. Um, I communicate on my phone with my work apps that are, that are at Lenovo's data center. I use some Microsoft apps that are out in Azure, and I do some things on my phone. That is pure hybrid AI at work right there, and we're going to see the same thing happen in the enterprise. Some things, like I'll give you an example of maybe a retailer that is doing loss prevention at self-checkout. You know, during COVID, we just couldn't get enough employees, so a lot of the retailers went to self-checkout. You know, self well, they were seeing a lot of loss, a lot of shrinkage through missed scans, either intentional or unintentional. Um, they put AI systems in. There's a camera above every one of the registers looking at how people are checking out, trying to prevent those missed scans, 
and reduce the loss and shrinkage out the door. Um, you know, that is a great example of um, running AI right there in the store. The latency wouldn't allow you to wait for a up and down trip to the cloud. So we run it right there in the store, but some of that data is sent up to the cloud for further refining and improving the model. So again, a great example of already we're seeing this hybrid AI world um, kind of come to life. And it's the only way to like really unlock the value of AI for everybody. Not everybody's gonna put their data up in the cloud. A lot of people, including myself, are gonna wanna keep some of their data private. And the beautiful thing about what we're doing with AI PC is we're gonna help customers manage what data can be used to build those personalized models um, about themselves. It's basically your own personal model, Ryan personal model, Lindsay personal model, a Scott, a Scott personal model, some of which is cloud-based, some of which is right here, and it will always stay on my lap, on my ThinkPad. I was just going to ask, Scott, do you have advice for developers or those building you know, AI solutions, how they can tap into hybrid AI, or what, what should they keep in mind in terms of sustainability and where their workloads are? Yeah. <clears throat> um, you know, again, I think the biggest thing that, that people need to be thinking about is just plan to right size the IT for the tasks that you're going to be doing. Um, it's all the rage right now to think about these big GPU machines, but very few people around the world are really going to need that kind of system. It's, in, it's super in vogue right now, and it's a lot, of the, a lot of the spin, but as we continue to go on and we take something like the innovations we've gotten from Meta, like Llama, Llama took you know, massive budget and massive amounts of power consumption to create that. But once we have that open source model, putting a company's data or private data inside of that and then customizing the model uh, for your own use. Let, let's say you're a banking customer and you wanna do some kind of mortgage analysis. You take your mortgage data and other trend data, you put it into Llama, you create a brand new model that's just for your bank. That is not a super, super heavy lift. That could be done maybe in the cloud, but it also could be done right there in site wherever your data is. Um, so, you know, without all the networking hassle, without the data movement costs, without having to worry about things like, you know, governance and security and data sovereignty issues, things like that. So, um, you know, data is just like the heartbeat of all things AI. And I, 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 and I think it's gonna steer the future. And we, we've always talked for a long time about data having gravity. This is gonna prove it even more that that's truly the case. So this morning I was actually thinking about journaling and I, so I opened up uh, an IDE and I started typing out my journal as a markdown file. And then what I wanted to do is run inference on that to ask it thoughts about, you know, what am I missing about some upcoming plans or maybe what am I overthinking? And it was, I think a good example of people probably wanting that data to stay private, to have the compute happening uh, on the edge. And I don't really want that to go up to the cloud. It wouldn't really matter, but. I think we'll probably see that kind of thing happening more and more. Um, so, Lindsay, I'll put you in the spot next. What's your favorite AI? Oh, sure. Thing? <laughs> I mean, I use AI for right now anything that feels super arbitrary, right? <laughs> Notes, that kind of thing. Uh, I will use it as a thought partner too, Ryan. Like, what you know, what's missing here, or what you know, any more context or that type of thing. But. I use it constantly for emails, notes, that type of thing, just summarizing things. It's, it definitely gets kind of the day-to-day the -day business, you know, admin stuff out yeah. of the way so we can actually, you know, think and yeah. focus Productivity on what's important. Productivity aspects of it yeah. pretty incredible, isn't it? We're on the, uh, yeah. the Microsoft Copilot uh, right now, and I'm part of the yes. test group, a fairly large test group inside of Lenovo. And it, it's truly amazing what it can do from a productivity standpoint to help. So. I agree with you there. Uh, so my favorite example. So give you a little history on myself. I'm, I'm from North Carolina. The only time that I've lived outside of North Carolina was I lived in Taiwan for four years back around 2010 or so. And it was a great place, but I did not speak Mandarin at all. Whenever I had to go to the bank, I used to have to ask my secretary to go with me to translate. So we've been creating these interactive kiosks that are like full of all different kinds of cool AI technologies. They use natural language processing to convert my words into, a, into text that we can put in the database. You can create the model that we query using a large llama, and then we privatize it. Um, it has an avatar living inside of this box that's kind of volumetric and it looks like a real human. That's all being you know, generated by generative AI. So you got all these kinds of cool AI coming together. But I could, you could speak to that in multiple different languages. Um, it's on all the time. 
And I always think to myself, man, if I had this when I was living in Taiwan, my life would have been so much easier. My, my secretary's life would have been so much easier too. She wouldn't have to go to the bank with me all the time. But you know, imagine I'm in South Korea and I walk into a bank and I want to speak to it in English or Mandarin or French. Um, we can program it to do that. That, that uh, avatar will be smiling all the time. It's programmed with the, with the bank's data. So it can answer all kinds of questions for them any time of day. It's just a really cool technology. And I think we're just the very beginning of what that's going to be. We, we actually had it at uh, the Circuit of America's last year uh, for the American Grand Prix, just answering questions about F1 for the fans, and people really got a kick out of it. So I think that's one of my favorites. It's kind that's of awesome. interactive, and it's a cool experience. But what's cool about it, you don't think AI is the first thing you think about. No, it just, it yeah. just feels great, and it yeah. makes your life easier. And it's delightful. I love it. Yep. Um, that, that puts my journal idea to shame. <laughs> <laughs> I, had, I had a lot of time to think about it, Ryan. You, gave me a <laughs> you lot did. Of time. Um, well, uh, let's wrap it there, uh, Scott. Really appreciate your time. Um, thank you for pushing things forward and, and for uh, moving things forward, especially with sustainability at Lenovo. You, you really do impact uh, things that I think people don't even understand how important they are. Uh, so I appreciate your time. Um, where can folks go to learn more? Yeah. Hey, Ryan, I just want to say thank you to Intel. You are, you all are the best partner, truly the, an amazing partner. Uh, the collaboration we do together is, is making all this stuff possible. It's, it's a really great thing to be a part of. So thanks for having me today. Thanks for the partnership. Uh, if people want to learn more, uh, Lenovo.com is a great place to start. If you want a little more information about AI, Lenovo.com backslash AI. Lots of great stories out there about how we're using AI to make the world a better place. Fabulous. Thanks. Awesome. Uh, great to meet you, Scott. You great much. conversation. Thank Take care. Thank you. Visit intel.com forward slash AI to learn more.